Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science Technology. In today's show, Rocket Monday, we're gonna talk about Chandra X-ray Observatory. So let's dive right into it. Well, first you have to understand the name. The name comes from Shubhamanyam Chandra Shekhar, uh, basically this person. And this person is known as basically Indian American astrophysicist, basically same way Neil deGrasse Tyson is. He was a Indian, uh, basically Indian born. He studied in India for like, you know, till post uh, graduation. And then he moved to uh, basically abroad for higher studies. So that's why he is an Indian American astrophysicist. And he won a Nobel Prize in 1983 in physics, so to say. So he has a lot of capability and he was a very instrumental in understanding stellar evolution aka what the heck happens to a star at the end of its life basically uh, white dwarf neutron star black holes basically high energy events he was very instrumental in figuring the, those part out and because of that he was the person who figured it out what is the barrier between uh, like either white dwarf or neutron star or black hole basically there is a hard limit that 1.4 uh, solar mass unit and that limit is called the Chandrasekhar limit because of this gentleman and to give you a context of the, how much he was loved basically he was the math, advanced mathematics teacher for Carl Sagan. Yes, you had that right. And Carl Sagan, in his own words, in his own books, uh, basically recommends him as like, you know, he finally uh, re realized the beauty of mathematics. So, suffice to say, very capable, uh, you know, individual. And you have to understand this. Many times, uh, many missions, let's say, uh, rover mission of 2020 would be named back, rover 2020, until NASA decides a name. So the observatory was also named some fancy acronym, you know, advanced X-ray observatory in space or something like that. And then uh, generally NASA will have a poll or, uh, you know, a voting or something like that. For this individual, there was voting done in 66,000 uh, people. And he was selected una almost unanimously, like, you know, we have to name this. So so that's just to give you the context of it, like how capable this individual was. Now, because we are talking about high energy, end of uh, you know star life kind of event, we are talking about very high energy photons, generally in X-ray uh, you know domain. Now, X-ray domain, you have to understand, that photons are just that, photons, but they are YOLO energy. They have way too much energy. See, only thing that can have higher energy is gamma rays. So that creates a problem. You have to understand this. X-ray does not reflect. You cannot bounce X-ray. So let's say you have a mirror and you send an X-ray photon. It's like full speed. It will either be absorbed or go through it nothing else will happen so you cannot reflect it so what do we do we utilize some metals have a unique ability specifically iridium so we coat our quote unquote mirror in iridium okay that's the first step we do not use aluminium sometimes gold have been used but uh, generally iridium is used so what else we can't reflect it what the hell we can do well it's exactly like how th we throw a stone in a pond think of it this way like you take a stone and you just drop it it goes through that's why uh, generally what we expect like in case of normal energy photon is just like you hit it it goes off like you know i equals r and all that jazz but that will not happen with x-ray so what we do we utilize what we call grazing incidence optics what does that mean? Think of it this way. You take that same stone that like, you know, sunk in the basically bottom of the lake, you throw it at the angle. Basically, you, you try to make it as shallow as possible. So instead of going like this, you change it like this and you bounce it off a little bit, just a little bit. So this is why we utilize for this exact uh, telescope nested barrel design. So basically, it's not like a glass and it's not even like a, you know, mirror telescope. What it is, just barrels and barrels are like guiding X-ray. They are not like, a, you know, OK, stop here, go 90 degree here. Uh, that's not happening. It's just like gliding it away. So one ring focuses on the another ring, another ring focuses on the final imaging focal plane. And to give you the idea, we can't control X-ray that much. The tube length, basically how long the tube is, that's 10 meters. Let that sink in. It's just like we have the optics in the front and then it's like 10 meter. Hopefully it will come into the focus at the other end. So you have to know that grazing incident optics. It does work. It does work for X-ray and not to mention nowadays it's a very important technology because all our silicon technology that is coming from uh, let's say 5 nanometer and all that, they require ultraviolet and a high level ultraviolet. Problem with that is ultraviolet also reacts the same thing. It will just go through material. So we use the same grazing incidence optics in uh, you know fabrication of uh, our semiconductor also. So it's a very important thing to learn. Uh, basically nested barrel design so this is how the core optics was built this is how we focused quote unquote focused x-rays now you have to understand this this was done very early on uh, so that time the reality was this mirror that we are talking about is very complex it's like ludicrously complex for what it is it's just a technically what it is is going to focus something but because we are dealing with x-ray the domain is completely out of most people's uh, understanding and scope so uh, nasa was like dude can you actually and not to mention this telescope was not a low budget telescope you can see that like it's a huge telescope it's freaking huge like 10 meter tube does not sound that impressive on earth but 10 meter on space yeah that's expensive so at, at that exact point 
ISS was being built, you know, International Space Station. So NASA was like, you know, should we uh, invest in this kind of, uh, you know, observatory or make sure ISS works? And ISS had to work simply because it was not America anymore. It was like, you know, America, Russia, Canada, uh, Japan and all that jazz. So they had to make sure that project was. So government almost canceled it. It's like, let's let's just kill the project. But a lot of fighting, a lot of hoo-ha. And then the realization was done. It's like because the, they figured it out, like NASA almost got it that like, show us a demo, like basically show the congress or demo that can you actually build those mirrors fancy mirrors they built it they learned a lot from it and it was like okay now you go ahead but you will make it smaller aka you will not change the main optics that will cost another extra time to figure things out you will just reduce the number of instruments that you are getting so originally they had like very large hopes and we're gonna put this instrument that instrument that was toned down it was like you know just put bare minimum and then Design in such a way that it will not require repairment because you have to understand this is the same time we launched Hubble telescope and Hubble telescope was designed in such a way that it could be repaired, it could be upgraded. We have upgraded it and unfortunately it was defective from the factory so we had to fix it so to say. But again, it did work out. For this purpose, that was the same original plan. But they are like, dude, we can't afford this. Because when you are talking about repairability, somebody has to be dedicated to this mission. And not to mention that's like, you have to allot uh, another uh, basically space shuttle launch. So they are like, no, you cannot do that. So after this reduction, they realized something very interesting. It does allow them, to, uh, they are putting this in lower orbit, but does allow them to make it into an elliptical orbit. Basically, they can throw it outside. What's the point? Like, there is nobody's going to go there and repair it. So what's the point of staying, you know, sticking to lower orbit? So they send it outwards, elliptical orbit. And benefit of that, it goes so far at the like at the highest peak, it's around 140,000 kilometers away from Earth. That means it clears the van anal radiation belt completely. Completely. It's like that is no longer saturating his instruments. That's awesome. So that uh, you know, uh, you know, budget cut actually started to give it a very good advantage that it will have much cleaner, uh, you know, because uh, high energy particles cut talking, much cleaner observation, so to say. And because it do that, because it has such an elliptical orbit, it also reached a point where it it can observe continuously, basically one long exposure of fifty five hours. That's awesome. So on low Earth orbit, you can understand that like Earth will always end up, uh, you know, blocking your view for 50% of the time. This time, Earth was barely blocking it. So it was awesome. Basically, it was that uh, bad times yielded a good result. Now it was launched uh, in a space shuttle. Now you have to understand the space shuttle was a waste of time. Basically, uh, Department of Defense was like, dude, give us this big of a payload bay, but they never used it. And uh, ISS does not have even a single component that utilizes the full bay. So even uh, Hubble was like, you know, very small puppy in this. So uh, basically to utilize uh, effectiveness of space shuttle, they came up with uh, something known as internal upper stage. Basically there is another rocket put into this because you have to understand space shuttle can only go into low earth orbit. It cannot go to geostationary you can't do anything other than that so if you have to send satellites to higher orbit you have to use a quote unquote kickstick a huge kickstick so they uh, figured that one can be done for this chandraya x-ray uh, observatory so this mission became the heaviest launch ever done by space shuttle so this was the only mission that technically utilized space shuttle to its 100 percent capability so like think of it this way uh, saturn 5 has capability of let's say uh, launching 100 tons 150 tons to low earth orbit if you send 150 tons, you are utilizing it. But if you are only sending, let's say, five tons for some reason, you are wasting it. So that was happening with space shuttle in almost every mission. This mission was the only mission. It's like, no, only space shuttle can do this. So that was done. And um, this a uh, lot of uh, people did that. And there was some interesting aspect of this. But this was the uh, first woman-led space shuttle mission. Basically, the commander was a female for the first time. So STS-93, July 23, 1999, this was launched. And it was successful. Now, what about the project success? Okay, you built the stuff, you tested it out, you launched it. What about, uh, love, you know, fruit of this labor, so to say? It was very successful, aka ludicrously successful. To give you a context of that, people think we're like, you know, uh, rovers we are talking about uh, from, uh, you know, opportunity and all that jazz. It's like, you know, it was built for nine months and it survived for this many years. This was built for five years with no repairability in mind and it's still going for. Basically, it crossed 20 year mark uh, one year ago. So it's at this point in time, 21 plus. And so far it has only one fault in one gyroscope and not to mention there was a backup put into it so that gyroscope is put into you know like an eye link so to say so it's still going on and not to mention black holes dark matter dark energy all that jazz we have to observe in them in multiple uh, you know electromagnetic spectrum this puppy was the first that could do that black holes observed it 
neutron star observed it. High neutron star collisions that created the gravitational wave that we detected in LIGOS, this puppet detected that. So you, to give you a context, like if you go into the Wikipedia page, it's like find what is the first done by this observatory, the list is ludicrously long. It's like, whoa, this is like, it's not as popular as Hubble telescope, but the amount of uh, knowledge it imparted on the humanity, it's on a different level. You're talking about something bonkers, so to say. To give you a context, like even on planets, like if you are f taking this telescope and just focus on a planet, like, you know, let's see what you're going to get. It showed that uh, there is an X-ray emission from Pluto. And to this day, we are like still figuring out how the heck that is even possible. This was done during uh, when the flyby was happening of uh, Horizon mission. Then we focused it on Jupiter and figured out how its magnetic field is affecting the X-ray emissions. So you can understand that this is a quite capable mission. And again, it paid itself. It's like, you know, we put so much money, effort and new technologies into this and it paid us in full. When you talk about high energy, black matter, uh, black matter, sorry, dark matter and all that jazz, this was one of the very critical instruments that allows us to double check every other instrument. Because this is one thing you have to understand in science. It never works the way where, like, you know, how movies make it appear. It's like, oh, one instrument, this figured it out, awesome. That never happens. You have multiple observations. So if you say, we observe this, uh, you know, celestial body, what is it? let's say Hubble shows something one would you take on that no hell no you will be like okay send x-ray telescope send uh, basically gamma telescope send radio telescope same ultraviolet telescope every damn telescope you have you will focus on it and then you will collect a complete picture and that is the primary reason why people hate james webb telescope because it has already cancelled multiple small projects that like that so that's why people hate it there you cannot make one instrument like for news articles it could look like that but in real life it never is like one instrument uh, you know end game that does not happen so this even photograph one of the most amazingly named photograph hand of god i'm not joking that's the actual name of the photograph of a nebula uh, that has a basically a neutron star spinning inside it it literally the first time the image was downloaded from the observatory they're like whoa that looks like a hand so they're like okay let's call it hand of god it's quite amazing beautiful picture i would urge you to google it so you have to understand this is a very successful mission not as well known as a hubble but surprisingly capable it was like to you'll put this puppy there it's like no I'm gonna do my work and it has like you know yielded so much fruit it's like many papers recently from neutron star white dwarfs and uh, black holes all of them will reference this one way or the another sooner or later they will reference this so it was very very successful mission so this was my presentation on chandra x-ray observatory i hope you liked it learn from it in that case please click the like button share it amongst your friends that will help me a lot if you didn't like it didn't enjoy it, i urge you to press this like press it twice to show me extra disappointment and please leave a comment because i try to reply to all of them subscribe press the bell icon if you're free and as always thanks for watching